bienvenidos una vez más al Instituto Cervantes de Manchester y Leeds, al canal de YouTube, en esta serie sobre bilingüismo que eh, coordina desde su inicio el profesor Dr. Villa García de la Universidad de Manchester. Uh, good evening and welcome again to the YouTube channel of Manchester and Leeds Institute of Cervantes uh, in Northern England. I am Pedro Sevier, the director of this cultural centers cultural centers in, in, in Great Britain. And this is a great pleasure to present to you the fifth uh, of our event in our series of Vancouver Bilingualism. Today, the lecture will be supporting heritage language acquisition when it matters most by Professor Silvina Montrul. Uh, thank you, Silvina, for being with us, uh, uh, for accepting our invitation. And um, of course, thank you Julio for uh, the uh, great coordination and for the ideas for this series. Silvina, who is a professor at the, in the Department of the Spanish and Portuguese of Linguistics at the University of Illinois in Urbana Champaign, and who will be introduced uh, with this chair uh, by Dr. Uh, Julio Villa Garcia. As uh, you might know, the, the audience who is following this series that is uh, in its second year, uh, the aim uh, is uh, to support and to, to bring to the general audience, not to the specialized uh, uh, people from the academia, uh, all uh, the matters related to bilingualism and how important uh, is to uh, support the bilingualism as a, an enrichment of our societies, how important is the involvement also of the public institutions through the educational system. And this, in this sense, it is very important that the, the, the topic of tonight is related to very much this idea and how important it is to support the language uh, 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 heritage, la lengua de herencia from the very beginning when we start being educated, attending school and being part of the society. Um, also, with this series, we would like to underline uh, the uh, paramount importance for the children's development, for intellectual development. We have been seen in the uh, have been uh, seen in this series uh, that uh, far from being or creating a confusion, that is a wrong idea. That sometimes there are parents or people who don't have a, a, a knowledge of uh, how the brain of the bilingualism uh, 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 function, that uh, by uh, bringing our children in a bilingual reality might be confusing and it would be a, a, a setback, a disadvantage, it's the contrary. And with this series, we want to underline that. We have also uh, in the series uh, been analyzing the importance uh, of bilingualism for the autism, for the people who are with problems in autism and the positive effects of bilingualism. So the list is very long. We have already, we are uh, today in the fifth uh, event of the series. We are very happy that we have even more people attending then. You can follow uh, the, or you can also watch the other uh, um, presentations about bilingualism in our YouTube channel. And we appreciate very much that you, the public, the audience can disseminate because it's the aim of this uh, uh, series, disseminate the importance and the positive aspects of bilingualism. I will now introduce our uh, um, guest, uh, Julio Villa Garcia, the coordinator of the series, who is um, uh, currently a senior lecturer in Spanish linguistics and syntax in the Department of Linguistics and English Language at the University in Manchester. And currently, Maria Zambrano, senior researcher at his alma mater, the University Universidad de Oviedo. Dr. Villa Garcia, uh, in the course of his PhD at the University of Connecticut, was trained as a theoretical syntactician and as a language acquisitionist, working within the framework of minimalism. His current um, um, interests lie in the areas of Spanish, Romance, and English linguistics. Other fields of interest are also child language acquisition, bilingualism, of course, and the application of theoretical linguistics research to foreign second language pedagogy. But before I give to you uh, the floor, uh, Julio, uh, let me remind our uh, audience that uh, 
in line of this work, in June the 14th, we will have another conference by uh, Professor, uh, Assistant Professor Christos Pliatsikas, who is Associate Professor at the University of Reading in the UK and Chair of the International Symposium of Bilingualism. So you are very welcome again uh, in the middle of June. And without much ado, further ado, the uh, paso la palabra a Julio. Muchísimas gracias de nuevo. Y uh, if you have any questions, maybe Julio will say that. If you have any questions, si tienen algunas preguntas, Puede formularlas en el chat, tanto en español como en inglés. If you have any questions, you can put them in our chat in English or in Spanish, and we will be delighted <coughs> to use both languages because I think a great part of our audiences are modern thing or understand Spanish. And it's also our aim to promote, of course, the Spanish languages as in public institutions, Institute of Cervantes. Muchas gracias, Julio. Te paso la palabra. Muchas gracias, Pedro. Muchas gracias, Silvina. Bienvenida. And thank you, everyone, everyone, for being here, particularly today, because it's part of the Easter break, and we know you are very busy with other commitments. It's a very special occasion. As Pedro said, I'm Julio Villa Garcia from the Lingua Research Group at the University of Oviedo and from the University of Manchester. And it's a great honor for me to introduce Professor Silvina Montrul. She will be delivering the lecture supporting heritage language acquisition when it matters the most. This is the second talk of the 2022 edition of the bilingualism series here at the Instituto Cervantes of Manchester and Leeds. Today we are extremely lucky to have with us one of the most prominent researchers in the realm of multilingualism in the United States and across the globe. And certainly a firm believer, a scholar who really believes that monolingualism is curable. <laughs> Silvina Montrul was born in Mar del Plata in Argentina. She studied in Argentina and in the United States and became a doctor in the field of linguistics and second language acquisition in Canada, more specifically at McGill University back in 1998. Her supervisor was the also very famous second language acquisitionist Lydia White. Ever since, Silvina's record of publication and scholarly contributions has been truly unbroken. She worked at SUNY Albany in New York State and is currently full professor in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese and in the Department of Linguistics at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. In addition to a university instructor and administrator and an expert on knowledge transfer, Professor Montrul is first and foremost a distinguished uh, researcher. She has held uh, many prestigious grants. She's delivered hundreds of talks. She has published countless articles in premier journals. In fact, according to Google Scholar, her work has been cited 14,357 times by other scholars in the field. <laughs> She's the author of four very important books. Most recently, she has published The Acquisition of Heritage Languages with uh, Cambridge University Press in 2016. She also published her first contribution in Spanish in 2013 with Willie Blackwell, El Bilinguismo en el Mundo Hispanohablante, Bilingualism in the Spanish-speaking world. And I must uh, confess that this book uh, opened my, my, you know, kind of started my interest in bilingualism, so I must thank Silvina publicly mm -hmm. here for that. I also used that book in my teaching back in Philadelphia mm -hmm. in 2013, and, and it, was, it was a real success. So thank you for that, Silvina. Mm -hmm. She's also published uh, Incomplete Acquisition in Bilingualism, Re-examining the Age Factor with John Benjamins in 2008. And four years before that, also with John Benjamin, she published The Acquisition of Spanish, Morphosyntactic Development in Monolingual and Bilingual L1 Acquisition and in Adult L2 Acquisition. For all these reasons, Professor Montrul is an example of what it means to be an academic. And we are extremely lucky that bilingualism, heritage languages, and second language acquisition feature among her main research interests. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Montrul. Many thanks for being here, Silvina. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Julio and Pedro and Carlos, uh, for your warm uh, welcoming and introduction and I hope I can live to the expectations you have set now uh, so I'm going to uh, share my screen and 
begin my presentation. And uh, something I want to uh, clarify is I'm going to be talking about my most recent work, which is very much in progress. Uh, I do have some academic um, terminology and maybe uh, I have a lot of data that I want to show, but at the same time, I'm, I'm going to tell a story, which is, uh, I hope the message is clear, even if uh, maybe the, the specific uh, details of the analysis are, are not that relevant for you, but I think, I hope the message is clear. And it has to do with the title of my talk, which is to support in a heritage language when it matters most. So uh, my interest in heritage languages, which is that it is a language that is acquired in a bilingual context, and it happens to be a minority language. Uh, started when I came to the United States, uh, as Julio said, I was a professor for one year at the University of uh, Albany in New York, having studied uh, in Canada in a bilingual city where bilingualism is very highly regarded. And then I came to the United States and I had, uh, I had to teach Spanish in Spanish and sp uh, bilingualism class in Spanish. And I had a lot of bilingual students in my class and I was at awe when I saw their language uh, and the way they spoke and the way they wrote. And that since then I've been devoting my, my time to this, understanding this, this situation and helping these bilingual uh, students and uh, citizens of the United States uh, re retain their, their language, maintain it. So some facts, uh, this is from the United States approximately 3. Point million uh, bilingual children in elementary schools, that is 75% uh, speak Spanish at home. And those who are in fourth and eighth grade consistently score at least 25 to 30 points below their English speaking peers in reading. So this has always been a concern of American public in general. The idea that bilingualism somehow is a detriment to assimilation and to, uh, and to become uh, uh, a citizen of the, of the United States. Okay, so with that thought in mind, uh, let me start uh, uh, telling you what happens when children learn a language. So by the time children start kindergarten, any child in any, every language, they have acquired basic voc vocabulary and most of the grammar of their native language or languages through social interactions in natural environments. So in order to, to go to school, you need to have a language. However, in, in the field of first language acquisition, we tend to focus, and I will see that on these first uh, few years of life because language emerges. However, language development undergoes further growth and consolidation during the late, late childhood, especially through exposure to written language at school. So this is an idealized development of a language. It could be related to the vocabulary overall or to specific grammatical structure. But what, what this means to show is that, again, when from the age of birth to, to three years of age, this is where the grammar emerges in children. So uh, children start to produce their first words. Then they go through the two word stage, then they start to put word, uh, uh, words into phrases, then the morphology arises, then they, they have multi, multi, multi word utterances, some, some complex syntax and semantic, uh, semantics emerges at this time, but all this, this is accomplished with implicit learning. That is to say the child doesn't know he or she is learning, but they, they communicate and they develop uh, linguistic knowledge. This is the, the foundation on which school builds. So then children go to school, depending on, on where they live. This could be after age four, five, preschool. But here's when they are introduced to reading and writing. And with reading and writing, many other things happen. So there is, there, we change the way we look at language. Uh, now we start uh, reading, so visual input is important. We learn new words, words that are more literate or more academic. Uh, we learn synonyms. Uh, we learn structures that are more common in written language than in spoken language. We gain awareness of intentions, pragmatics, meanings uh, conveyed by sentences that is not literal meaning. 
And also we, we gain knowledge of registers that the way you speak is not the way you write. Or when you talk to your friend, you use certain language, but when you talk to your teacher or to the school uh, director, you use a different, uh, different language. And that goes on until adulthood, okay? So uh, I'm going to be uh, concerned with what happens during the school age period. So strong language skills are the foundation for the development of literacy. So if a child doesn't have language, oral language developed uh, between the ages of birth and four or five, it's very difficult to learn how to read and write because you have to have linguistic, a linguistic foundation. So I'm mostly concerned with grammar like Julio. I like morphology and syntax. And uh, that's what the child learns during the first few years, the grammar of their language. And vocabulary is part of the learning, but it's not grammar, okay? And that is, the child brings oral language comprehension and production and the strength of this system is what supports literacy later on when they go to school. So uh, we know very little about language uh, development during the school age period. Uh, in general, in linguistics, we tend to focus on the first few years and in second language acquisition, we focus on adults. The syntax uh, tends to focus on the knowledge of adult native speakers but we lack understanding of how different linguistic experiences like being monolingual or bilingual influence language and literacy development and academic achievement. So what is the relationship between literacy and linguistic development during the school age period? And I think this is a period that is significantly understudied in linguistics because it is usually the realm of education and learning to read. So, but from the point of view of linguistic development, many things happen in this uh, period. Uh, many aspects of linguistic knowledge continue to develop well into mid late, late childhood and early adolescence. For example, we are talking about more complex sentences like complex noun phrases, like uh, relative clauses with uh, modification. We have more embedding in personal forms and passive constructions, which is going to be the focus of the rest of my talk. Um, so what happens uh, with uh, heritage speakers uh, who are during childhood, okay? So as I said earlier, if this is the route of bilingual development, bilingual children, and many, I met many of these children in Canada were, who were exposed to English and French from day one, uh, but we have this situation in many other countries and in, in Europe in particular, uh, the child is, is at home interacting with their care, caregivers. And if there are two languages spoken at home, the child will develop the two languages. Sep they, they develop two separate systems. Uh, the systems develop like the monolingual uh, system of a monolingual child. However, they can interact a little bit. So we know from early language development that every, every child is born with the capacity to learn more than one language and handle the input for two languages. But we also, the, the period I have been studying the most is the other end, uh, people in their early adulthood. When we see that some bilinguals now have a very unbalanced development. So they are more dominant in the majority language, the language spoken in the society, and they have they lag behind in development with respect to the home language, the heritage language. And this is uh, assessed by language tests that, that look at their morphology, their syntax, their vocabulary, and they, they make, uh, they don't score as high as in their other language. But again, the question is what happens between all this potential that we are born with and the reality that we end up? What happened in the middle? So that's why I want to focus on this period, the missing link, because many things happen here that are very significant to what happens here. So that is why I'm talking about the time that matters a lot is the school age period, 
because we are born with a capacity to handle two languages. Very young ch children can do it very well, but then things happen in life, okay? So there is language loss in children. They have not reached linguistic maturity and mastery of many properties of their language. And so they exhibit what I have termed incomplete acquisition, which can also be attrition of certain properties of their native language. So attrition assumes that something was acquired and then weakened, was weakened, weakened and, or lost later on. While incomplete acquisition assumes that something was not fully acquired or mastered in the first place. And then let me give you an example. So in language development, we look at different properties of language, like the evolution of the verbal morphology or subject expression, or in this case, it's plural morphology in Arabic. And Arabic has a very complex system of plurals. It takes children eight years to achieve what is called 90% accuracy in obligatory context, which is one of the criteria established in the 70s for morphological development. So a child has to show 90% accuracy in obligatory context to, to say that something has been acquired. So it takes eight years. So that's a long time. Uh, so if, if input is not sufficient during that time, it can affect the, uh, the development of this form. Here's an example of two bilingual children uh, from Puerto Rico who immigrated to the United States at ages uh, four and six. And then they were uh, recorded uh, longitudinally and uh, their language was examined two years after living in the United States. That's the first recording and then two years after that. And the older sibling, Beatrice, this, is, this, is, uh, this data has to do with gender agreement with nouns. Children, uh, Spanish speaking children master agreement with nouns, noun phrases by age three. These are six years old. At the first recording, she produced 0% errors. That means she was a native speaker of Spanish for gender agreement. But two years later, this child is making 5.8% errors, which is a huge percentage for error for gender agreement. That's, that would be attrition. She knew it, then she, does, she knows less. The other child, Victoria, at age four, she already produced 8.5% error rate, which is way higher than a three-year-old uh, who is living in a monolingual environment. But two years later, that percentage grows even higher. It goes to 18.6%. So the younger, the more dramatic the loss, okay? So this is a percentage of errors. This is data from, that I graphed from uh, Car Silva, Carmen, uh, Carmen Silva Corvalan's uh, 2014 book, which is uh, the, she followed her two grandchildren uh, who spoke English and Spanish from birth. Uh, here I graphed the um, amount of input she, re she uh, reports. So these children were, the mother spoke English and the father spoke Spanish. So they were exposed to 60 to 70% of English during these six years of life and 25 to 30% of Spanish. This, and Brent, who is the other, the sibling, younger sibling, a little bit less that happens with siblings. This graph shows that when Silva Corvalan looked at their, the development of English and Spanish measure, this measures MLU, which is a um, morphosyntactic measure to, to measure um, development in young children. This amount of exposure to Spanish and English was sufficient for the children to develop the two languages in parallel way, parallel form. And there was no difference from three-year-old English-speaking and Spanish-speaking children. However, after the three years of age, only 25% of Spanish a day is not sufficient to develop the complex tense aspect and mood system of the Spanish language, knowledge of copulas, ser and estar, and the uh, expression of subject pronouns. So while English continued to grow, Spanish did not grow further. Okay. 
why do children lose language? Well, there are two uh, main ideas. One is it has to do with the quantity of input. Input is exposure. How much exposure do you get to the language? So if you don't get enough exposure, then you're not going to hear many words, structures, and you're not going to have the opportunity to use the language which you need to develop the language. Uh, and that leads to attrition and incomplete acquisition as, as I just showed you. But the other idea is that it's the quality of the input. That is to say, what the children are hearing. And here, some of our, my colleagues have said that especially in the situation of Spanish in the United States, it could be the case that the parents are already speaking a variety of Spanish that has a lot of these features. Basically, the children are copying the language of the parents. The problem is not the language of the children, it's the language of the parents. So in the past few years, I have tried to really look at this possibility. And here's a study that I have a new book coming out, which is a study of this phenomenon of Spanish. It's called differential object marking in linguistics, but for if you are teaching Spanish, it's called la personal. Uh, and it is the use of the preposition a uh, with animate objects. So in this picture, you have to say el lobo atacó a caperucita. But many bilinguals in the United States say el lobo atacó caperucita. So they do not produce that preposition. Uh, I have been studying this phenomenon for many years. Here's an, uh, a, a study where they had to retell the story. Then we counted how many instances of animate objects with, with and without the preposition a uh, what uh, they had in their speech. We see that these are younger bilingual children, Spanish English bilinguals and their mothers. The mothers are a 98% accuracy with la personal, whereas the children are 59% accuracy. So the, the mothers are producing la, it's the children who are not. And then these are older uh, mothers and older children uh, and again, we see that the mothers are doing much better than the children. Then we look at these uh, individual results. So every dot is a person. And these are like, you should read this like this. This is the mother and the child, the mother and the child, the mother and the child. And we see that most mothers are at 100% accuracy with the personal, but the children are not, some are them 0%, others 20%, others 50%, others 100%. So there's no correlation between what the mothers produce and what the children produce. This is the same type of data for the adults. Again, we see a lot of variability in the adult heritage speakers. Some of them produce a personal, others do not, or sometimes. And now some of the mothers are starting to fall off, off the chart. So after many years of exposure, of living in an, another environment, you could start to show features, but they are not as dramatic as in the children. This is another study of the same phenomenon recently conducted by Alejandro Cusa and collaborators. Again, the blue bars are bilingual children in the United States, ages uh, six to uh, 12 year olds. The uh, orange bar are monolingual children in Mexico, same age. And the gray bar are the parents of the bilingual children. And what we can see is that the bilingual children do not produce a personal, but the children in Mexico and the parents of the bilingual children do. So when the children in the United States omit a personal, it's not because they are copying the parents. Another study that I recently conducted with one of my graduate students, the same topic, but this time in Turkish. Turkish also marks uh, animate objects like Spanish, but instead of doing it with a, a preposition, they do it with accusative case marking. And in this study, we had three groups of Turkish speakers in Turkey, ranging from three years old to adults. And then uh, child heritage speakers, school age in the United States, adult heritage speakers, and the parents of the children, first generation immigrants. And what we found in a story written in tax, similar to the one I just showed you, is that all the, the groups in Turkey, including the three-year-olds, 
uh, did not differ in their production of accusative marking uh, in Turkish. But in the United States, the immigrant parents were no different from the Turkey groups, but the child heritage speakers and the adult heritage speakers did omit case marking significantly more than everybody else. And here's the similar data, but this time with a comprehension task. So the problem is not just in production. Here we see that the child heritage speakers and the adult heritage speakers of Turkish in the United States perform less accurately than their parents. And their parents do not differ from the groups in Turkey, except this time for the very young children, because the very young children have difficulty when the tasks with comprehension tasks that require a lot of pictures and, and choosing, it's, co it's cognitive complex, but not in production. And here again is a graph that shows the relationship between the language of the parents and the language of the children, and there's no correlation. So the children and the parents are doing different things. And finally, this is a study on Greek bilinguals in Canada by Daskalaki et al, 2020. This time they looked at the position of, sub, of subjects, overt subjects in Greek. So if you ask a question as what happened to the lamb, the answer is la rompió Pedro that like you have to put the subject behind the verb. And, and if you do an interrogative, like, uh, I don't know what Pedro broke, no sé, no sé que rompió Pedro. Again, it's like in Spanish, you have to put the subject after the verb. And let's start here on the right. Here, ceiling performance means almost one, everybody is doing very well. Bilingual parents of, and monolingual parents are all doing 100%. They don't know where to put the subject. But when we look at the children, monolingual children are like at ceiling, and now bilingual children are not. These graphs mean, these are the means, and this means that there's a lot of variability. So they are not at ceiling with embedded inter interrogatives. And with the questions here, we see again, the monolinguals and bilingual parents to some extent are at ceiling, monolingual children are at ceiling, heritage speakers, second uh, the, the children of first generation immigrants are not at ceiling. And now we see that parents who are bilingual themselves, that like the heritage speakers are the ones who are not at ceiling and neither are their children. So for these parents and children, there is a relationship, but for the others, there is not, okay? So, Those are the relationships. So what this data show is that young bilingual children do not necessarily receive attrited or changed input from their monolingually raised parents. However, the children of bilingual parents may be different. So when children do not produce a personal or do not produce case marking in Turkish, uh, it's not because their parents do the same. It's because their language has developed differently. So I am, uh, I am inclined to think it's the lack of input during the school age period. So what is the impact of schooling on your language? This is a study from 1983, but I like this study a lot and I like the design. So they looked at Chicano children in uh, San Francisco and they were tested on, on tests of Spanish production and comprehension, well, it was a similar test in Spanish and in English. Well, we have children in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, and fourth grade. What we see in Spanish is that uh, production, uh, there's a difference between kindergarten and first graders, but then they, they, they go down. So the uh, production of Spanish go, diminishes over the years. And the fourth graders look like the, kindergartner uh, kid, kids. While in English, we have a growth pattern. So in, in, four, in fourth grade, they are better than in kindergarten. For comprehension, the decline is less uh, abrupt. 
they they manage they they maintain comprehension of Spanish over the years, but English continues to grow even more. And then in this study, they looked at specific grammatical properties, and they the the kindergarten children were studied two years later. It was a longitudinal component, and they looked at how they they did with past tense, relative clauses, and subjunctive. And these are the structures that two years later, they had declined in accuracy. So again, this is, this is a case of language loss over time. Now, let's go to the Basque country, uh, a place where the Basque lang language is protected in its territory. And Basque speaking children are schooled exclusively in Basque. Uh, I am, my understanding in that is that the, the um, program D is now the one that everybody uses where 80% or 90% of instruction is in Basque and Spanish is just a subject. And one of my graduate students just completed a dissertation that looked at the uh, production and comprehension of null and overt subjects in Spanish and Basque bilinguals. And in one of the uh, tasks, she developed a elicited production task with a little story. Uh, so you tell what happens in the first two pictures and then the child or the participant is supposed to tell you what happens in the third picture. And depending on how you set up the story, sometimes you, you require to use an null subject, and sometimes you're required to use uh, an overt subject. And she did this in Spanish and in Basque. In both Basque and Spanish are null subject languages. And these are the results of null subjects. And we see that six, eight, and 12 year old children and adults were tested in Basque and in Spanish. They were bilingual, and there's no difference between the 12 year olds and the adults with respect to these. Uh, the production of null subjects in the two languages. And then when we looked at overt subjects, we have a similar uh, story. Again, we have a story. They have to tell us what happens in these pictures. Then we ask a question to tell us what they would say for this picture. And in this case, they have to use a pronoun. And we see that there is growth over time because there's a difference between the six-year-old and the adults. But by the time children uh, reach 12 years old, they, are, they very much behave like the adults and the differences are not significant. So this study shows that when you support Basque and you live in a place where there is Basque and Spanish, the two languages are developed uh, equally well. She also had Spanish speakers from Madrid who were not different from the Spanish speakers from the Basque country. But let's come back to the United States. The introduction of literacy in English leads to the attrition and incomplete acquisition of grammatical aspects of Spanish that play a significant role in the comprehension of complex syntactic structures. Weaker language skills in the first language or in both languages delay the development of literacy in Spanish and English and negatively impact academic progress. So, in situations of access to instruction in Spanish and English, the continued development of both languages is expected and in fact possible. So again, uh, the, what we're doing in this study is trying to understand the relationship between the grammar that needs to be supported because this is the foundation for literacy. So if children are having problems with literacy, it's because they were taking their grammars away, okay? so. How does language proficiency relate to long-term literacy outcomes? Research on bilingual children's linguistic proficiency in Spanish is scarce, and research on these children's English proficiency is limited to teacher ratings and global standardized tests. But we need to see is, we want to see results from linguistic measures, measures of specific linguistic structures with literacy and cognitive measures to understand the relationship between these variables. Okay, so uh, Rabbit and Tolchinsky 2002 talk about linguistic literacy, which are aspects of linguistic knowledge that are affected by, by learning to read and write. 
So written language exists as a notational system. So we have a phonology, an orthography, a morphophonology, and a morphology, and a discourse style. We, we talk about written and spoken language, which have different qualities. When children go to school, they start to analyze language in a different way. So literacy leads to a more analytic understanding of different components that comprise linguistic structure. However, we do not understand the relationship between learning to read and how this affects language processing. So my graduate student, Andrew Armstrong and I are working on this project and we are advancing this hypothesis is called the literacy enhancement hypothesis, which says that the development of literacy skills and exposure to textual input during the school age period leads to more robust linguistic representations of morphosyntactic structures that improve psycholinguistic processing mechanisms such as working memory, input monitoring, and cue reliance. So uh, reading contributes to language experience. Increased text exposure leads to greater production of object and passive relative clauses in eight to 12 year old children. Phonetic differences between African-American English and mainstream English may cause difficulties in learning to decode school materials. And these facts point to literacy as crucial, as a crucial component of language experience during later language development. Literacy appears to exert long lasting effects on the strategies that low and high literate adults use to comprehend language. So we are looking at again, uh, the relationship between structures that are morphosyntactic structures that are acquired early in life, but are very important to understand complex syntactic structures that are also related to literacy. So in Spanish, in order to do verbal passives, la casa fue construida por el constructor, you need to use agreement in your past participle. El hombre fue alimentado por la mujer. And sometimes that gender agreement gives you an indication of what we are talking about. The other phenomenon I mentioned earlier, el a personal, if you, you know, can, can mean the difference between the interpretation of relative clauses. Este es el chico que vio a Juan does not mean the same que este es el chico que vio Juan. So that preposition means a lot. Okay, for comprehension of complex sentences. So uh, I'm now going to show you data from this uh, work in progress where we look in more detail at the relationship between literacy and comprehension of passive structures in Spanish as a function of how literate you are in your native language. So most heritage speakers develop literacy skills in their second language. In the United States, most, most Spanish speakers go to English only schools. There are bilingual schools. I'm going to show data from some of them, but not everybody has that opportunity. So if learning to read and write contributes to language development, what are the consequences for L1 growth when literacy is acquired in the second language? So we focused on passive sentences I mean, Spanish had different types of passives, but we focus on the verbal passive. Why? Because this is a structure that is more common in written language than in spoken language. It's common, frequent in technical, academic, and official documents, in written language more generally, in journalistic texts, especially with the by phrase, and in scientific writing. And this is likely to be one structure that is learned in school. So, Individuals who do not develop literacy skills will have little exposure to passives and as a result, comprehending passives. So from the linguistic point of view, we have a sentence like the dog chased the cat. The dog is the subject. The cat is the object. In Spanish, el perro casó el gato. Uh, o puede ser persiguió al gato. The passive, we move the object to the subject position. The cat was chased by the dog. But in Spanish, again, we need uh, 
we changed the animal here. La rata fue casada por el gato. To show that you have to make agreement with the past participle now. Okay. Um, so in, do, in order to process passive sentences, there are complex sentences, so there's increased cognitive load. Comprehenders must carry out multiple tasks in order to successfully interpret the sentence. For example, attend to morphosyntactic, gender number, and participle auxiliary cues. Reanalyze the theta roles. What used to be a subject is now an object. Sorry, uh, object is now a subject, and they are, the subject is now an agent. Establish movement chains, like relationship between these elements, and interpret the biphrase. Uh, now, we know from a lot of work, a lot of my work and other people's work, that heritage speakers have significant problems with gender agreement in Spanish, uh, especially with inanimate nouns. So if agreement, gender agreement is important to interpret uh, passive sentences in Spanish and you have problems with gender, then this could present a problem for comprehension of passive sentences in Spanish. So, and this could be even more problematic for low literate or heritage speakers who lack L1 literacy because they may have reduced ability to track morphosyntactic cues during comprehension. And non-canonical word order is to say, now we change the word order of the phrase uh, and having to make object agreement. So you have the need the participle with gender that can also create problems for production and comprehension. We have data coming from England by Eva Dabrowska showed uh, a few years ago that when you give people with different literacy levels in English, sentences like the man was beaten by the dog, they are 88% accurate on, the, on these passive sentences. But if you say the dog was beaten by the man, which is implausible, 74% say this is, this is correct, okay? Because uh, we have this plausibility issue. Dabrowska replicated this in, Dabrowska was in, it's in Birmingham. She replicated this technique with L1 English speakers who had different levels of formal education. And she found that less educated speakers successfully interpreted implausible passives with an accuracy rate of only 36%. And, Second language learners of English with low levels of education scored over 90%. That's because usually second language learners have a lot high literacy compared to less educated uh, monolingual speakers. In sp what do we know about, about passives in adult heritage speakers? One, one of my students, uh, Noelia Sanchez Walker, that this was also part of her dissertation, she tested knowledge of uh, adjectival and verbal passives with ser and estar and preterit and imperfect in heritage speakers, second language learners and monolingual speakers of Spanish. And she found that those heritage speakers who had had some bilingual education earlier in life scored higher than those heritage speakers who did not receive any bilingual education earlier in life with respect to the comprehension of uh, passive sentences, especially with era, with imperfect and the verb ser. So our research questions for this study, how does language experience measured as literacy in the first language or mixed input influence the development of morphosyntactic knowledge in heritage and native speakers of Spanish at different stages of development? And here we're looking at school-aged and adult populations. What effect does this have on Q integration, gender morphology, word order, plausibility, during the auditory interpretation of complex syntactic structures, in this case, passives? Do these factors interact with other cognitive processes like working memory, the ability to remember a series of numbers or, or letters that are known to play a role in comprehension? And that's the quantity and the quality of the input received in school impact uh, the processing of the native language. So here we are looking at children who are attending dual immersion schools in Spanish and English, and those who are going to school only in English. So we had uh, 50 child participants between the ages of nine and 12. 
25 were attending English only schools with no almost no opportunity to practice or use their Spanish in an academic setting. And the other ones were attending bilingual school instruction provided in Spanish. The mean age was around 10 and a half years. All children spoke Spanish at home from birth. There's no reported reading, speech, or hearing disabilities. And they, part they participated from a variety of locations, Arizona, Illinois, and California. This is because uh, we did this study during the pandemic. So we had to change all of our protocols. Uh, and uh, I'll tell you more about how we had to, um, to do this, but basically uh, we had to do this over Zoom, okay? The adult participants are 25 Spanish speaking adults raised in a Spanish speaking country, mean 45 years, uh, years of education, eight and a half. So some, some people with only elementary school, others with some high school and others with no education in this group. And then we compare those to 25 monolingual Spanish speaking adults raised in a Spanish speaking country with 21 years of education. These are university and postgraduate students. Uh, they were all educated in Spanish, primary, secondary, and university studies. There's no reported reading, speech, or hearing disabilities, and immigrated to the United States after age 18. The tasks we had, uh, the linguistic task, which is a gender proficiency task and elicited imitation task. And then we had all these tasks that are supposed to uh, tell us something about how fluent they are in literacy measures. And then we had uh, a working memory task that, it, that is about cognitive uh, speed, let's say. We had other tasks, but I'm not going to be talking about those. Uh, so in the gender proficiency task, uh, this was adapted from another study I did with Kim Potowski a few years ago, but uh, they are presented with animals uh, in different colors, red, black, yellow, or white, because they are the only colors that we can use, uh, change with feminine and masculine. Um, and the participants were prompted to identify each animal and color like veo un pingüino rojo, okay? And so here is a graph that shows how accurate they were with the animal words. These are the university adults. These are the adults with lower level of education. These are the children with English, attending English only schools. And these are the children attending bilingual school. And what you need to look at is that the spread of these bars, meaning there's a lot of variability here and this black line so the university people are at ceiling, maximum score, followed by the other adults, followed by the uh, bilingual children in Spanish who, who have Spanish instruction, and the bilingual children, Spanish speaking children with English only instruction are performing the lowest. And we will see this pattern in most of the data I'm going to show you. So that blue bar is going to be the lowest, okay? So here is, gender errors. And we see that the native speakers with university education never produce a gender error with these animals. Okay, this is very common. The, the native speakers with lower level of education produce some errors. But among the children, those who are going to English only schools are making lots of errors. Okay, compared to the children attending uh, bilingual schools. So these children, the ones attending bilingual schools receiving Spanish instruction are significantly better than the ones not attending or, or doing school only in English. Okay, so then we had a task which was, it's called the sentence repetition task. They had 60 items but the most important ones for our purposes are the 20 passive sentences, 10 were plausible and 10 were implausible. And we, uh, we look at the accuracy of response, which reflects processing ability because they have to comprehend a syntactic structure, store the material in working memory and generate the, origi the original structure, okay? So sentences were like, ayer fue mordido el hombre por la ardilla. So there is a difference in gender, hombre y ardilla. And this does, does make sense because 
un hombre puede ser mordido por una ardilla. But then we have a condition like plausible and minus informative. Ayer fue mordido el hombre por el perro. So here we have two masculine noun phrases. So there's no difference in gender. Then we have condition C. Ayer fue mordida la ardilla por el hombre. Here, the sentence is a little bit nonsense, but we have a difference in gender. And then the last condition is implausible and no gender distinction. Ayer fue mordido el perro por el hombre. Again, uh, this is likely to cause a lot of confusion, okay? So um, we looked at how they did on all the structures overall. And here again, the pattern is the same. These are university adults ceiling. When you see this line, meaning the maximum score, followed by the adults who had lower level of education, but these don't differ from the children attending bilingual schools. And again, the lowest scoring group is the children receiving schooling exclusively in English. Then we looked at passives versus actives. And then of course, everybody does better, especially the children in the active compared to the passive sentence. But this distinction is dramatically difficult for the, the children attending English only schools. So they are very inaccurate at repeating sentences with passives compared to the children receiving schooling in Spanish. And these are the four sentences I showed you. Uh, this is plus plausible plus informative, the blue bar the, and the everybody does better with that sentence compared to the others. For the university adults, there's no difference between the sentences, but for the other groups, they tend to do better with the most uh, distinctive and plausible sentences compared to the least uh, informative and, um, and um, implausible. And as you can see here again, the lowest bars are the English speaking children, the children attending English only schools who are now receiving Spanish instruction. Uh, and here we looked at plausibility, whether it's the uh, man biting the ardisha or the ardisha biting the man. And of course, for the children, this makes a difference. When the sentence makes sense, it's easier to, to repeat it than when it doesn't. And this is gender was not very significant, but we think it might be have to do with the task. So when we, so in this task, the children are asked to produce, to repeat, and sometimes they change the sentence. So for something they would say, a child going to English school, anoche fue mordido el vampiro por la señora. They say, anoche fue mordido la vampiro de la señora. Or, ayer fue cuidada la veterinaria por el pingüino. They would say, ayer fue caricatada el pingüino de la veterinaria. Uh, ayer fue estudiada la mariposa por la científica. I got the scientifica and the mariposa. So they, they didn't remember there. Example of higher proficiency children. Ayer fue estudiada la mariposa por la científica. They say, ayer fue investigada la maestra por la mariposa. So they change the words, but the children with lower proficiency could not produce, replicate the passive sentence with the by phrase. So then we looked at literacy measures, text comprehension, word identification, pseudo word reading and reading fluency and vocabulary. And the patterns are the same. These are the university adults. These are the children attending the English only schools which are uh, doing worse than the bilingual children in going, uh, receiving schooling in Spanish. And here there's no difference between the less educated adults and the bilingual children in Spanish schools for text comprehension, text comprehension. This is for word identification. Again, we see that the bilingual children in English only schools have the most difficulty with this task. And there's no practically no difference between the bilingual children in um, dual immersion school and the uh, adults with lower literacy. Reading, same thing, uh, bilingual children at receiving Spanish instruction, much better than bilingual children not receiving that instruction and not very different from adults with lower uh, uh, literacy level. 
sorry, reading and fluency, same thing. And then vocabulary scores by group. The bilingual children have higher vocabulary scores than the adults with lower proficiency. The bilingual children attending bilingual school, okay? And finally, working memory, which is how many uh, items they remember. Uh, here we see that these are the university educated adults. And the next group is the children receiving instruction in Spanish and English. They are better than the other two groups, okay? So the results provide evidence that strong literacy development, which often occurs in school via textual input, exposes children to increasingly complex syntactic structures like passives. And this type of language experience appears to aid the Kyrgyz speakers in, in the study in sentence repetition of verbal passives. Plausibility rather than gender informativity on the past participle appears to have a greater impact on structural accuracy during repetition, especially for the children. And this means that Kyrgyz speakers, even those receiving uh, literacy instruction still rely on context and top-down uh, processing um, information. Uh, however, this study that we re I reported today was originally planned as an eye tracking study, which we had to interrupt because of the pandemic. So we have the materials to, again, they, the children would see these pictures on a screen and hear the sentences and then uh, respond to a question and these are the participants in the sentence. Um, this is again, auditory um, processing. And uh, again, this, this study had to be uh, interrupted, but we hopefully will, will be able to complete it after the pandemic eases up, okay? So what are the implications of all these findings for bilingualism and education? These results provide evidence in support of the literacy enhancement hypothesis because increased exposure to textual input provides additional benefits for language development beyond oral input received in the home language. And the children are able to gain more vocabulary and the way they process sentences is different. However, further research is needed to understand the details of how literacy impacts language growth in areas such as lexical access and morphosyntactic representations. Although this is counterintuitive, supporting the heritage language during the school age period helps grow and maintain the heritage language and does not interfere with the development of English. Children who attend English only school develop the majority language at the expense of losses in the heritage language. And they may not perform in English literacy measures as well as bilingual children receiving bilingual education. And here I just showed you results of Spanish, but we are doing results of English and Spanish. This is something that I'm sure if you have seen the lecture by Kim Potowski, she talked about this data. This is from bilingual schools showing reading scores in children who attend, Spanish speaking children who attend different types of schools. And those in yellow are the two way bilingual immersion that are doing better in reading in English than those who are receiving more English instruction. And this is, from, uh, this is from schools in Maine, uh, those who received English mainstream education and those who received bilingual immersion. Again, those in bilingual immersion were, would have higher scores in reading than those not being immersed into languages. So future work, we need to do uh, to further our understanding of input literacy and language development by studying additional structures, looking at corporate analysis of school books, and testing heritage speakers with structures that occur in DIL1 and DIL2. Uh, of course, we can do studies with different languages with different writing systems. Uh, but you know, we want to see how uh, research uh, using literacy to strengthen the heritage language may translate into overall growth in the L2 as well. So we do have more studies with nine and 10 year old monolingual Spanish children, uh, English and Spanish bilingual children. So comparing both monolinguals and bilinguals, we are continuing to explore the role of English only and bilingual instruction and bilingual children's literacy outcomes. 
And we hope that this findings beyond the linguistic interest that some of us may have can also contribute to improve the education of these children and contribute information to the schools. So we are developing more studies like this. And we, this is kind of the design we have in mind, which is, sorry, uh, looking at children in dual English school, dual language schools, but looking at both their Spanish and their English. Today, I just presented data on their Spanish, but we're also testing their English and uh, children in English only schools. And then since these dual immersion schools in, include in English monolinguals who are acquiring Spanish, we also want to know how learning Spanish contributes to their English as well. So this is all the work we are doing. And thanks to the funding from my university, the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes for Health of Health. Mucha, these are all the people, of course, I could not do any of this without the huge support I have from colleagues in the United States, in Mexico, and my graduate students. I have many graduate students working with me on all these topics. Entonces, muchas gracias. And you can ask me questions in Spanish or on English. Thank you so much, Silvina. Muchísimas gracias. As you said, uh, the floor is open to everybody. You can put your questions in the chat and uh, uh, Julio will uh, put the questions to you. Uh, formular las preguntas. Entonces, uh... Thank you, Pilar. Pilar is <coughs> García Mayo from the University okay. of Basque Countries is thanking you for a wonderful talk. And you know, before um, we have some questions, so we have some time for questions. Of course, I want to ask you a question, Silvina, that I think it's been forming in my mind for a while, but, but as you were speaking, I think I thought about it again. And this has to do with, not so much with the definition of a heritage speaker, mm -hmm. but with, where do we really, when can we be sure that, that a child or, a, or an adolescent is a heritage speaker? In other words, how can we draw the line conclusively between somebody who would be considered a bilingual, I know balance, balance bilingually, I learned mm -hmm. a lot the book, it's not easy, you know, how do we draw the line between a heritage speaker and a, a bilingual? Okay. A bilingual, a heritage speaker is a bilingual, okay? So if you live in Montreal, where I studied, you have people who uh, speak Spanish and English. It's, it's a natural way of being, but, or you can be in an English only family or a French only family. Uh, both Spanish and French are official languages of Canada. They have status, they have schooling, they are, have vitality in the society. So when we talk about a heritage song, we're talking about you are a bilingual, but one of your languages is not a majority, one of your, and it happens to be your native language is minority, a minority language in your territory or man, minoritized, and that's another way. So it is at a disadvantage in the society in terms of resources. Your only opportunity to learn that language is through your family and what your family can do. So that's why it's a heritage, it's a language that you, it's part of your heritage, but it's not usually supported in the society. And when I, in my book, when I write about heritage languages, there are different, different situations that I call heritage situations. First of all, any language can be a heritage language. So Spanish is a majority language in Spain, but it's a heritage language in the United States, in England, and in many parts. Uh, so it has to do with the socio-political context and the conditions under which the language has been acquired. That's what makes it. So when, when for example, MISO in the 1990s did all these studies on very young bilingual children, some of them, I would say they are heritage speakers. If you are Spanish living, a Spanish speaker living in Germany, Spanish is your heritage language, <laughs> you know, even though it's Europe. So. That's my definition. 
So can it, I'm just curious, okay, uh, can it just change, uh, can, can your status as a heritage uh, speaker change across the lifespan or is right. there a, a deadline? Yes, okay. yes, no, there you can change. So one thing that um, I don't know if you have heard, but this is a very fascinating topic is the returnees, okay? So we have, I, and in my book, in the 2016 book, I talk about heritage language reversal. And one of my students is, uh, my Turkish student is now, her, her dissertation topic is going to be about children who grew up in the United States, Turkish children, but then went back to Turkey. And now they are living their adult lives in Turkey. Now Turkish used to be a heritage language in the United States. Now they are living fully in their, now it's their main language and English is their heritage language, okay? So we are looking at what happens with that language once you are an adult and now you are fully immersed, living your life in Turkey. Right. If there were aspects of the language that you didn't seem to have when you were eight or nine or 10, can you gain them back at age 30 after living there? So, and then Cristina Flores from Portugal uh, she, she's also has done a lot of work on Portuguese, German bilinguals who have changed, you know, Portuguese speakers who have returned to Portugal. And, you know, so that that can happen, too. Wonderful. Thank you, Silvina. I'm going to move on to our uh, audience's questions. In the interest of time, Rachel uh, poses the following question. What's the best approach for making a bilingual, I mean, for raising a child bilingual, if only the father is living in the United, only this, sorry, the father is Spanish and lives in the United Kingdom. What language input is considered enough to establish a correct domain of Spanish? Okay, so the father, let me, is this in the chat? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, what is it? Okay, so what I showed you, the, the data from Silva Corbalan, that is Silva Corbalan's son married to an American woman, and those are her grandchildren. So the father is the, English, the Spanish speaker in the home. And as you could see, the father only and the grandmother were the only sources of input for this child. So you, I mean, the idea is that the child has to be able to receive input in that language as much as possible. And if it is only the father who is available to provide that input, well, uh, we want the father to engage with the child a lot, read to the child, and then find opportunities for that child to use the language with other children. That would be, a, so find like a, a, a play group so that the child knows that the language lives beyond the father's uh, circle. Um, and, uh, and yes, and, and continue to enrich that child's linguistic environment at home. And then when, they, when it's time to go to school, find or create, create as a parent, a group where, you know, you can read to children or play in Spanish or do things because that time is very important, that childhood. Beyond age three is very important. Emilia has a related question. Do you have any suggestion for those of us raising bilingual children when we don't have access to a bilingual school? Uh, uh, Pedro también tiene una pregunta. No, uh, uh, just sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Just a comment related to the previous question and the answer. Uh, I, 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 will, I would like only to underline that uh, in the case of the United Kingdom, it's important to know that in the three Institutos Cervantes we have, you will find an atmosphere where the bilingual families from Spanish mm. origin can provide this input for children to play with other children in Spanish, to attend storytelling in Spanish, mm -hmm. and to socialize with Spanish. We only know, we all need know how important uh, for the children is to feel no different from the other. Right. So in this environment, Hispanic environment in, in the United Kingdom in this case, is so important and that's mm -hmm. also one of the aims of the whole series to, okay. to show uh, our support 
Okay. The Hispanic uh, heritage language or the Hispanic uh, Spanish language for the British, but also for the bi binational or bilingual families. So, in resume, there are the schools, but there are also space, leisure space, like uh, cultural uh, cultural centers. Okay. That, that's where you can bring the children, and uh, and uh, you have books, you have other families, and you can socialize in Spanish. Thank you. Oh, that's great. I, I'm very happy that the Instituto Cervantes is doing that because it is true that question that you ask, not all of us have opportunities to, to send our children to bilingual school. So in my, in my particular case, I'm the Spanish speaker at home. My husband is American and my children did not have these uh, schools that I'm mentioning now are becoming more common in the United States, but I didn't have that opportunity for my children. However, now there are three schools in Champaign, uh, but they are new. Uh, they, they were not there when my children were growing up. So I did create a, pro a program for Spanish for children through the university, although it ended up being more second language children, but my daughter was there for six years and uh, she speaks Spanish very well today because I think <laughs> creating that program uh, during those years was, so important. She was going four times a day, a uh, week to classes, one hour a week a day, but it was enough for her to find a community of kids and teachers and, and learn a lot of content in, in that environment. So I think, yes, we cannot have bilingual schools for everybody that, that it would not be possible. But I think that if the parents and the teachers become aware that again, Supporting this language in whatever shape and form you can during this time is fundamental for, for these adults then to, to be proud of their heritage and to, 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 to have a language that, because many of them, I, I've also, many students come to talk to me saying, you know, I have this background, but my family chose not to speak that language to me. And now I have regrets. So, it is so sad when they come with these regrets or my parents wanted to speak the language and I didn't want to speak and now I have regrets. So that's why I'm saying this time in the life of a person is so important for language. So we have to do everything we can to provide the resources. It can be school, it can be a reading group, it can be a play group, but la the language needs to be part of the picture. Absolutely. Wonderful. Marcela asks the following question in español. Muchas gracias, Silvina, por esta charla. Vengo leyendo su trabajo desde hace mucho tiempo y es muy interesante toda la labor que viene realizando. La pregunta es, ¿han hecho trabajos para desarrollar la lectoescritura del español como lengua de herencia? Y para, por ejemplo, aprendices que deben alfabetizarse en lenguas semíticas uh -huh. en su país, ¿no? Con cariño de otra Argentina por el mundo. Uh... Ok, el problema de alfabetización en los hablantes de herencia de español continúa siendo un, un tema bastante eh, eh, importante en Estados Unidos porque vemos que tienen, tienen fallas a nivel de alfabetización. Eh, o sea, algunos hablan muy bien, eh, tienen muy buena pronunciación, pero todavía les cuesta mucho la lectoescritura. Y no sabemos por qué, porque lo aprenden en inglés. Y español es una lengua mucho más fácil para aprender a leer y escribir. Pero el tema de los acentos y la ortografía es algo que les parece sumamente difícil. Eh, yo creo que los programas de español como lengua de herencia a nivel universitario es precisamente ahí donde tratan de hacer, poner el énfasis, en hacer más hincapié en la lectoescritura. Eh, pero esto se soluciona leyendo, leyendo y leyendo. Eh, y escribiendo eh, y eso fue casualmente lo que me eh, dio el ímpetu para empezar este trabajo cuando tuve mi primer puesto en Nueva York y vi que mis estudiantes hablaban, eran muy fluidos en su español cuando hablaban pero cuando vi cómo escribían y no sabían dónde empezaba una palabra y terminaba otra no lo podía creer entonces ahí eh, me di cuenta que sí, que esto, esto era un una cuestión que venía de, de, de hace muchos años. Y, 
y hay, bueno, y hay programas que se están, enfatiza, enf, están enfatizando más la lectoescritura. Sí. Thank you so much, Silvina. We go back to, to English. Rachel uh, is grateful for your answer and she has a follow up comment. We've been advised for myself, English to speak only English to the baby and the father, Spanish to speak only Spanish to. Uh, to the baby in order to prevent the baby getting confused between languages. Is this something you would recommend? Is this the one parent, uh, one language approach? This is actually, I, I, that's what I taught yesterday in my psycholinguistics class. Uh, bilingualism, children are not cognitively confused. This is another problem. Doctors don't know what they're talking about. Speech pathologists don't know what they're talking about. And many teachers don't know what they're talking about. When they advise parents to just focus on one language. The, your, your child is perfectly normal, can cognitively cope with the two languages. Yeah, some people use the one parent, one language approach. It doesn't matter. As long as your child is exposed to the two languages and uses the two languages, he or she will develop the two languages and he's, he or she is not going to be confused. However, there are periods where the child is going to mix the languages. This is normal. Doesn't mean he's cognitive, cognitively confused. There will be some interference from one language on the other. This happens to all of us who are bilingual. So there's nothing wrong with your child. I would strongly advise you to continue to use the two languages with your child in any form that is convenient for you and your family and does not uh, make your, your, your child not like one of the languages. So go for it.